started my career as a legal aid lawyer, so it's funny that you do um, <laughs> that work. I mean, I, I did eviction defense and immigrant. I ran the whole asylum project and did a whole bunch of stuff and started working for labor unions um, in 1995 or so when I was laid off from legal aid during major cuts during the Clinton administration for Legal Service Corporation, and there were major cutbacks in legal services all over the country. Um, and I was hired by AFRA, which is the American Federation of Television and Radio Artists. Um, and I was in their broadcast department, which is the department that represents TV news anchors, um, TV reporters, radio DJs, talk show hosts, etc. So all of the, not the actors, but the, um, the news and music type people and all the radio people. Um, and then I moved into doing um, both organizing in the Spanish language media market as well as in the broadcast market as well as moving into doing the legislative work for the Los Angeles local of AFTRA. So I was there for about 12 years and I left AFTRA when there was some national restructuring that took place and then I was hired as the organizing director at the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, which is AFSCME which is the largest public sector union in the country um, with about 1.8 million members, soon to be a lot less because of the upcoming Janus decision. Um, and we could talk about that. And um, then I left AFSCME about four and a half years ago and I am the business representative for the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees, Local 871 which is a relatively um, small local union with about 2,300 members. It represents um, a number of basically administrative positions within the entertainment industry, from script supervisors to um, production coordinators, assistant production coordinators, art department coordinators, production accountants. So a lot of the real behind the scenes uh, people within the entertainment industry. That's so sort of my background. Yeah. Um, we had a couple questions, and um, sort of to give a broad framework, we wanted to ask what the sort of what you see, like what's the necessity of unions, or what sort of um, what what ben what are the tangible ben benefits? Well, the tangible benefits of the union is that if you don't have a union, you don't have any voice in your workplace. I mean, you know, your boss decides what your working conditions are, they decide what you get paid, and that's that. And if you have a problem, if you get discriminated against, if anything happens to you, you can go find a lawyer and pay somebody a lot of money to represent you. Um, but you also don't have the same number of rights that you have if you're represented by a labor union. So. Um, you know, I mean, anybody who works, in my opinion, should be represented by a union and have a voice at a bargaining table um, to help set working conditions and wages um, for the jobs around. I just wanted to do a quick break. Hi, this is Charlene, yes. uh, who was at the Howie Wolf Forum and was interested in grounding. So I decided to come check it out. This is some of ground game. <laughs> <laughs> we can go over the one-on-one -on -one introductions a little later. Um, so I, I kind of a general question that, that some people have is like, how do you go about unionizing? We have a friend who works, um, he's not, he works at a hotel, but he's not one of the unionized hotel people. They're kind of subcontracted out. And he was considering trying to do something about it because he's having a lot of like unfair things going on with the hours and the shifts and stuff like that. So. Okay, so the process of unionizing, um, I mean, obviously the first step would be figuring out what union he should call um, to get assistance in what he's doing. Um, and obviously that would be the hotel employees, restaurant employees, international union, HRE, uh, Local 11, here in Los Angeles. And um, I mean, the process really begins with figuring out who it is we're talking about organizing. So what job is he in? Um, who else is in those jobs, how many people are there. I mean, the starting point, when somebody calls me about an organizing campaign, um, you know, I first want to meet with them individually. I want to find out what the concerns are, what the issues are. Um, I want a list of every employee that is in that job classification and sort of figure out, 
you know, you need to figure out, are you talking about one hotel? Are you talking about a chain of hotels? Are you talking about one classification of people? Are you talking about everybody who works for the employer? Um, and then the process of union organizing really starts with one by one by one organizing. I mean, um, lots of union campaigns are run by um, doing a blitz of house meetings. So you get a list of all the employees, you get a list of their houses, you have organizers, they go out to the person's home and start knocking on doors. Um, you know, lots of organizing campaigns, and it's somewhat easier these days in terms of getting information about people, because again, the hardest piece is figuring out who's there and who you need to talk to. Um, but so the process is going out, meeting people, um, getting a sense of whether people want to be represented by a union, um, you know, explaining to people what their rights are. I mean, in this country, we allegedly have the right to organize into unions. We allegedly have the right to be actively involved in our unions. Um, and people are retaliated against every single day in this country for organizing into unions. Um, people are fired regularly for organizing into unions. So you, at the start of a, any decent organizer, at the start of a campaign, is also going to let people know what the risks are. Um, when you get involved in organizing, you know, it is stepping out. Um, and usually, um, you don't want to be particularly public about it as you're starting, and you want to build, uh, you know, real support. And at some point, you'll probably want to go public with your organizing committee. Um, and then the process that is set up in the law is a process where once you have, what the law says is once you have a third of the people in a particular bargaining unit. So the question is defining what that bargaining unit is. Again, it could be one classification of people, it could be everybody who works for a company, it could be, in our industry, it's even more difficult to figure out because you're looking at a multi-employer. Our contracts are with you know, all of the major studios. So when you're looking at a multi-employer bargaining unit of a group of workers, you know, if you wanted to organize production accountants, you know, you need to figure out who they all are. Um, and it's not like there's a list that somebody can hand. It's not like going to a hospital and getting a list of all the nurses and, you know, pretty easy, you can check them off. How is your um, bargaining unit defined? How is our bargaining unit yeah. defined? The bargaining unit for the IA is defined as um, the various classifications working for the various employers. And there's a list at the beginning of the contract with a list of about, I don't know, 200 employers, you know, from Disney to small production companies that sign on to the contract. And is there like a specific I know you described a couple different sorts of uh, positions or jobs. That the are IA contracts, the way the IA contract works in Los Angeles, it's, there's a basic agreement which um, is in effect for all of the members of the IA locals, which goes from, again, we represent the vast majority of the behind the scenes people in film and television. So that goes from our people, I was talking about my members who are administrative folks, we represent, the IA also represents the directors of photography, all the camera assistants, everybody in the camera department, everybody in the electrical department, everybody in the sound department, everybody in the art department. Um, we represent everybody behind the scenes, the costume de designers, um, the costumers, people doing the sewing. I mean, people go out and buy the clothes. People, we, we represent everybody, the painters. Um, so when we do our negotiations, we negotiate a master agreement with sort of the big picture stuff like health and pension and the things that affect everybody. And then each local goes in and negotiates on behalf of their specific crafts. Um, there's lots of unions. So, and so what's interesting about the IA, IA comes out of sort of the old AFL tradition of labor unions, which was craft unionization, right? Where a craft would get together, the bricklayers would get together and organize. And it was sort of the skilled trades that organized in this country, you know, primarily the male skilled trades um, organized. And then there was a different model of organizing that came in with the CIO, the Congress of Industrial Re Organizations, which was wall to wall, you go into a factory, you organize everybody from the secretary to the um, professional employees in that factory. So it's, it's a different model of organizing. So you sort of have a mixture of that in modern times, where you have some organizing that's craft specific, um, and IA is very much that. Um, or you have others that you're going into a facility, like the Service Employees International Union will go into a hospital and organize across classifications. 
whereas the California Nurses Association will organize the nurses of a hospital and not organize the other classifications. So it really just depends on which union you're talking about. Is there a certain percentage you have to buy into it before you go into? So legal, so the process, let me go through the legal process and then I'll talk about how we really do organize them. Um, the legal process is you have to have 30% of whatever your defined bargaining unit is to sign an authorization card. An authorization card is a confidential document that the employers will never see. Once you have 30%, you can file for an election with the National Labor Relations Board, and then an election gets, well, the first thing that happens is the employer fights with you over what the <laughs> bargaining unit is. Of course. And in, under the old rules, um, it could take something like two years just to have that argument. Like they would begin their anti-union campaign as they would start holding hearings and delaying things. Um, under the Obama administration, there were changes to those rules that make elections take place much more quickly. Um, but no union in their right mind would go in and um, file for an election if they have 30% of support. Usually you want somewhere around 70 to 80% of support because once you start the campaign, um, you know, not in every single instance will the employer run an anti-union campaign, but there are very few <laughs> employers that do not run some form of an anti-union campaign. And an anti-union campaign can be from just, you know, telling people, oh, you know, it's up to you, but I really don't like unions, and I'll tell you why I really don't like unions, um, to you know, having one-on-one -on -one meetings with employees, having captive audience meetings with employees, putting out literature on a daily basis, barraging people, um, you know, making it very uncomfortable in the workplace so that the image that workers have is that unions cause animosity in the workplace. Exactly. It's the union's fault, it's, it's not management's fault, right? So part of the whole anti-union campaign is to make people feel uncomfortable and unhappy and feel like, you know what, it was really better before we started doing this because this really sucks. Mm -hmm. And it does. I mean, who wants to be called into mandatory meetings and mm -hmm. told things all the time? You start fighting with your co-workers because there will be anti-union people, mm -hmm. you know, and, it, it can, and they really like to make sure that that type of stress and animosity is heightened. So is there a membership? Like, would I be paying a membership fee to be a part of the union? Or? During an organizing campaign, again, all of those types of questions depend on the union, although I would say that the vast majority of unions, if not 100% of them, do not charge a penny during an organizing campaign. Okay. We do the organizing, we negotiate a first contract, and once we have a first contract in place, then they start paying. Then the membership. Then they, okay. right, they do not join the union um, or pay dues or do anything until there's a contract in place. Exactly. Um, which means that unions that do organizing are expending quite a bit of resources and so there's always the need to educate your members as to why organizing is so important, right? So I mean one thing that happened in the labor movement is that things got very um, you know, in the 1950s and 60s, when unions were really strong, a lot of union members became very complacent mm -hmm. and really don't understand what their unions do, mm -hmm. take for granted all of their benefits. Um, and so as membership in unions has gone down and down and down, I mean, ever since the um, you know, 1970s, really beginning with, if you think about the assault on unions, it started in 1980 with Ronald Reagan. Um, and it has just gone further and further and further ever since then, so that now the density of unions is 7% in the private sector. I mean, it's abysmal. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, and then if the Janus decision comes down, which um, is expected that it will, um, the whole purpose of that is to really hit the public sector unions um, who have a little bit more density than the private sector and completely destroy the labor movement in this country. Can we do a quick thing? Who in this room is protected by a union? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not. Yeah. We used to have a union, but we no longer do somehow. We have a parity agreement with the DAs who are attached to some union, which is... So who are you? You're the public defenders? Yeah. Okay, so with the, um, the PDs, I used to work at AFSCME. Um, the PDs... Somewhere around 20 years ago, there was an association that included the public defenders, the district attorneys, um, and at that time, I think it was just those two groups. 
because I think it was before the alternate public defenders opened and it was before the child support was a separate group. Um, and SEIU tried to organize them um, and they did not have a successful campaign. When I was at AFSCME, we successfully affiliated the Association of Deputy District Attorneys into AFSCME, and they actually are, they ended up disaffiliating after I left, but they are a union, they do negotiate collectively, and the um, public defenders were never interested in gaining union representation, which is kind of interesting that the DAs understand the power of unions in the public sector um, and in the county of Los Angeles somehow more than the PDs do. I think it has to do with the nature of leadership in our office, but I'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, no, it was, yeah. Working with the attorney, I mean, I, so, so I know one of the questions that Miranda sent um, to me is the issue of, you know, organizing professionals versus the, you know, organizing the working class. And, you know, I mean, I'm somebody who probably has more experience organizing professionals than most union organizers, um, from the district attorneys to anchors and reporters and, you know, people on radio and television to everybody that the IA represents. Um, I mean, many of them would, you would, be, would be considered professional employees. Um, so, you know, in terms of the need for unions. I mean, what, what's funny about the public sector piece of it is that the way, the way that negotiations work in the county of Los Angeles or in the city of Los Angeles is again the big picture issues like benefits. You know, I mean, for the last 15, 20 years, the main focus of any union negotiation in this country has been protecting pensions and protecting health benefits. And you know, really, the only remaining pensions in this country are for unionized employees. The only remaining real health insurance in this country is for unionized employees. Um, and we've been fighting for those benefits for the last 15 years. Nothing has gone into anything else in most union negotiations other than more and more money into health insurance to pay pharmaceutical companies and insurance companies um, like like we do. Um, so I think that there's an understanding of, in both the county, in the city of Los Angeles, similarly in the entertainment industry, that those benefits and the negotiations and discussions about those really big issues, the only way you can be involved in those discussions is if you're, if you're unionized. Um, so for the public defenders to not be involved in that discussion, they've chosen, they just get what is given to them. Um, rather than being part of the negotiation that takes place around it. What's your deal? Can you talk about like the question I had about busting some of those myths, like the you know the the unionizing is just for the working class? Um, I can't remember what it's like. Do you have some of the other yeah, like all of the you know if you have unions you're just striking all the time it creates <laughs> laziness like these are some of the that's the, the anti-union campaign right I mean so the literature that you'll get when you're when the bosses are running their campaign is that the union just wants your money um, you know they they have big salaries for those union bosses and they need your money in order to pay them um, they don't do anything for you. Um, they, there was one that you talked about that I just, striking. Uh, the striking issue, that they, that they will pull you out on strike immediately. I mean, you know, the number of strikes in this country compared to the number of unionized employees is fairly tiny. Um, you know, when I, when I do organizing within the IA, I mean, anytime anybody would talk about that, when was the last time there was a strike of, the IA in Los Angeles. Um, I don't even know the answer to that question. Um, you know, with the city and county of Los Angeles, when was the last time there was a major strike? It just doesn't happen that often with most unions. Um, on the other hand, there are unions that use strikes fairly effectively and have been able to get pretty, you know, pretty good um, resolutions to strikes. I mean, especially in this day and age, it's very you know, you really have to be careful about when you pull workers out because if you're pulling workers out on strike, you want to make sure you have an end game and you're going to get them back in and you're going to win that strike um, because losing a strike is much worse than settling before you pull people out of work. Um, 
you know, so, and there's many, many ways to put pressure on companies before you get to the point of that end game of pulling workers out. Um, you know, lots of the public campaigns that you see, I mean, some of the Justice for Janitors um, marches that happened in the past were not necessarily during a strike. They were just part of the public pressure so that they didn't have to have a strike. Um, you know, so, I mean, the myths are the, the unions, yeah, they just come into the workplace, they create strife and animosity, they don't do anything for workers, and they just want your money. Um, and, I mean, it's amazing that people think that there are people doing this work who work for unions, which is a really hard job, you know, in a day and age where unions are under such attack and that we're really just doing it because we want money. I mean, I, you know, I'm a lawyer. I can make a hell of a lot more money someplace else. Um, you know, we do this because we believe in it and because if we didn't have unions in this country, we wouldn't have most of the benefits that we take for granted. So when you start talking about, you know, whether it's having a weekend, whether it's having an eight hour day, whether it's having social security, whether it's having Medicare, um, anything that workers have in this country, overtime benefits and pay, um, child, you know, in, in, in California, paid family leave, I mean, all these things are things that unions have fought for. So if unions weren't there, and it's part of why they're attacking unions, and you know, you see what's happening today, we're going backwards. And if, you know, what the Republican Party wants to do is take us back to the 1920s, which was before unions were strong, and before we had Social Security, and before we had Medicare, and we, when we had even more homeless people on the streets than we have today. Uh, with, the, with the sort of attacks on unions that are going on right now, and also with the um, very precarious nature of work in the 21st century, what are some things that you think unions ought to be doing to fight back? Especially with regards to the precariousness, because it's, you know, it's, a lot of people aren't in a position to be in one job or one industry even for as long as before people are, you know, Ubering and task rabbiting and, you know. Well, I mean, some of the issues they're having with Uber, I mean, there's a whole fight over whether Uber drivers are employees or not. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, there's, there's a number of issues. I mean, one is, you know, looking at the models of organizing that have happened in the past. Yeah, it's much easier to organize a factory that has a thousand people in it and they're all working in one place and that's really easy. Um, there's going to need to be developed different models of how we organize. I mean, when I think about you know the role that the um, the entertainment industry unions play, I mean, thinking about and I'm trying to compare it to sort of the Ubers and the places where people are sort of working for different companies and sort of. I mean, the only way that there's health and pension plans in the entertainment industry where people are working for these little production companies here and there and wherever is because it's all being paid into what's called the Taft Hartley Trust Fund. Mm -hmm. So without the existence of the union in the entertainment industry, you wouldn't have, there would be no way for these freelance employees to get benefits. Um, probably long term, there would need to be something developed like that for some of the, um, the types of jobs that are that exist in this economy. Um, but I mean, the Uber, some of it is really just fighting against the legal standard of what is an employee, and Uber drivers should be able to organize, and I think that they, I mean, I don't think, I mean, they are organizing in certain places. Um, you know, the whole fight for 15 in terms of McDonald's workers, and you know, I mean, part of the problem that's happened in this country, again, is manufacturing has left the United States, as what's left are service jobs. I mean, those are the jobs that were never organized. And so what we're facing now is that the jobs that are left, because they've taken all of the middle class jobs out of this country, are either jobs that require, you know, a college and graduate school education that may pay decently and may, people may be in forever, um, or there are jobs that are less skilled jobs and that we need to figure out how to organize and protect people working in them. I mean, because the jobs available to young people when they get out of college, I mean, I have two kids who have graduated college. You know, they work in the service industry. That's what everybody's working in today. That's, that's the only jobs that exist. So we need to figure it out. So, um, a more subtle myth, if it was a myth, you know, um, what about the idea that unions 
are good for the people who are lucky enough to be in the union already, but that it locks out other people from, you know, from getting those same jobs uh, by, let's say, creating too high a standard. And I mean, in the past, I think some unions uh, kept out African Americans, when, so they couldn't get certain types of factory jobs because the unions didn't want them. And uh, that's an example. Uh, in the 70s, I grew up in Ohio, so it's a, uh, you know, that was a, the time of the decline of the auto industry in the country. You know, the, the, it was very powerful and it was starting to go, there were a lot of strikes, a lot of, a lot of tension around, but they had excellent benefits, you know, but at the same time, uh, I think they started creating other factories elsewhere that weren't unionized at all, and people could get that work. They were willing to work for lower salaries because they needed work. So there were people who needed work that couldn't get work, you know, because they couldn't pass the bar to get into the union. My one experience with the union was as, very briefly, I had a temp job in, in the post office, and the union people were getting three times what we were, and they were basically literally standing around laughing at us for doing work, loading the crates and stuff that they were also supposed to be doing. So I don't know why they had that two-tiered system, but you know, uh, what what do you say to that criticism that unions may actually kill off themselves in a way? Oh, I did system? say that unions became well a tier two system. I, I I'm not sure. I, mean, I don't know the example of what happened in the post office, but usually unions are fighting against subcontracting um, because what subcontracting does is it undercuts our contracts. So I was. That's what I mean, sorry, because then then people who aren't already, you know, like, it's not easy to get a union job. So uh, a lot of people just. I just read an article about Amazon unionizing the Amazon. Uh, warehouses mm -hmm. because they have a lot of subcontractors, right. a lot of temp employees. You know, they're not unionized. They're it's it's, it's shitty conditions and, and bad wages. And but on the other hand, you can go to an agency and get a job at an Amazon factory, but the warehouse. But if you if they had a union, you couldn't. Why would you be able to get a job if they had a union? That that's a myth. All right. Well, that's what I. So like I mean, to if address. they so if Amazon had a union and you got hired by Amazon, you would have 30 days to join the union. I mean, but it's called union security provision. Why? Well, that's what they'll <laughs> tell you. Sure, if they have. Okay, so maybe you're right. So if employers have to pay a livable wage and provide benefits, and they'll hire less people. I mean, I don't think that that's something that we should accept. In this country, this country can afford to provide benefits and a livable wage to people, and it's outrageous that, that they would make people make people think that that you know if we unionize work, it's going to cut jobs. That's just not ever been shown to be what happens. So, I mean, in terms of have unions done bad things in the past in terms of racism and other stuff? Of course, they have. Um, I think that if you looked at today's labor movement in Los Angeles, it is an incredibly diverse labor movement that is working on, you know, at the forefront of immigration rights issues in this city, um, at the forefront of issues related to young people and the fight for 15. So, yeah, I mean, we can talk about the 1970s and what unions did wrong, but we should talk about what unions are doing today and how we're changing. And, you know, the AFL-CIO changed its position on immigration. I mean, you know, unions just take the position that we shouldn't have immigrants in this country because they will bring down standards and we don't want them and we don't want them in our unions and we just want white people in our unions. And, you know, that's not the labor movement of 2017. I mean, we are at the forefront of these progressive fights. So it's changed. I mean, yeah, there was criticism. It's completely yes. accurate. Huh? Uh, so one of the weird inversions I've noticed with the labor fight here is like, I believe it was the Volvo plant, like in Georgia, where Volvo, a German company with a strong union, you know, presence in their home country was like, we want a union for our workers to negotiate with, the state fought against them. But my question was going to be, as globalization brings manufacturing here from other Western developed countries and they bring unions with them, do you see that as an entry point for American unions to resurge? Or? Well, they don't bring unions with them because the German union doesn't represent those workers. So what they're doing is they're opening um, car manufacturing 
um, located in right to work states where it's harder for unions to organize. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing, you know, car manufacturing in Tennessee and Georgia, um, not in Michigan, although I guess Michigan's right to work now too, which is also <laughs> amazing. Um, but some of those plants have brought with them a, a desire by management to have a right. union to negotiate right. with. Do you think that that's just a management tactic for them, or do you think that that's actually a foothold that labor could, could I mean, use? certainly could if they're, I, I don't know enough about it. I mean, I'm not, I'm not there and I'm not doing that organizing, but, you know, clearly any company that is coming from Europe is certainly used to stronger labor laws and stronger unions. I mean, one thing that Americans don't understand is like when you start learning about everything in this country, right? I mean, we have some of the worst labor laws um, in the Western industrialized world. I mean, right to work laws, for example, are just, I mean, there, there are countries where it's just it for granted there has to be a union to represent workers. I mean, that's just a normal course of business. And the fact that this country has convinced workers that unions are bad is just incredible. I mean, it's just, they've done an incredible job in terms of the PR. Um, I was gonna ask a question about automation, but since we're talking about right to work for less, mm -hmm. um, is there any uh, sort of cross-platform negotiations like between the IA, for example, which is a, is a pretty strong unit, as I'm a former IA member, uh, for, you know, in, in, in places like Los Angeles and California where those unions are strong and they're thriving, to be able to give some of their proceeds, some money to places where right to work is preventing the unions from actually getting the money they need to be able to hire the negotiators that they need? Well, you mean in terms of unions sending money to other states to do Yeah, just some, some sort of like collaborative effort because I'm... I mean, I'm sure there's lots right. of international unions that are doing that, but I mean, in terms of the IA in particular, we probably, more than most unions, do a much better job in right-to-work states. So, you know, as production left Los Angeles, now fortunately it's coming back, but, um, you know, with um, production in Georgia, with production in Louisiana, um, we have lots of union members working there, and we have lots of people joining the union and understanding the benefits of unions. Um, now, obviously, there's also a lot of people who love to get those union benefits and not have to pay a penny for them. So, you know, I mean, to some degree, what Right to Works does is it forces unions to not be complacent and actually do organize. I mean, we need to get members to understand the value of unions, and we should be doing that work anyhow, right? I mean, they need to understand what we do. Um, the difficulty, of course, is, as I always say to people, if you had a choice to pay your taxes or not pay taxes, and you could still send your kids to public school, and you could still drive on the freeway, you wouldn't want to pay your taxes, right? I mean, that's the big issue in this country. I don't want to pay for it. Well, it's the same thing with right to work. I mean, yeah, if you can get union benefits and union representation for free, and you have to be treated like everybody else is represented, you know, why, why would you want to pay for it? And it's just amazing that that's the law in most states in this country at this point. So touching back off of the uh, automation on the Amazon comment that was made earlier, is there anything that unions are going to be able to do to stand up against uh, what seems to be an inevitable push by companies toward automation of so many of these jobs that are on the more precarious side of things, like warehouse work or Uber and all that? I mean, in terms of what unions can do, I think it's a question of what unions can do and what the progressive community can do. I mean, the union, unions don't have any more standing on that issue than anybody else in this country. So, you know, the management is required, when we represent workers, management is required to negotiate with us over wages, hours, and working conditions. They are not required to negotiate with us over how they conduct their operations. So the choice to change technology that might eliminate jobs is their choice. We, we, they have to negotiate with us over what that means for the men, people who get laid off. Well, that's lovely, but um, you know, I, it's a big question that this country is gonna need to face because we're in a country that doesn't care about workers, that doesn't care, you know, doesn't seem to care and understand what it's gonna mean when, when more and more people don't have jobs. I mean, this whole idea that you know, the solution to homelessness and the solution to poverty is getting people education. Well, not if there's no jobs for them even after they're educated. I mean, you can only have so many lawyers and so many doctors, and you kind of need other jobs that pay money. Um, 
So it's, I mean, it's really scary. We're in very scary times. What would you see in some ways that uh, groups, progressive groups, lefty groups that are not themselves union members uh, can do to assist with the work of labor? Because essentially, you know, we're sitting here and there's a lot of, representing a lot of different professions, some of which are unionized, some of which are not. Uh, what are ways for us to help the well, it's funny, I mean, the other labor movement's having, you know, the same discussion. What's, you know, what's our role of the labor movement? How do we, how do we increase our community coalitions? Because, you know, labor in L.A. has, again, it's been at the forefront of immigration issues and has a lot of strong relationships with immigration groups. It has been very involved recently in affordable housing issues with, um, you know, by doing J, uh, is it J? J, 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 J,
and I don't know the specifics, but it might require people to re, um, like re sign every year that they want to be represented by a union. I mean, some really stringent stuff, which is just ridiculous. I mean, people just don't do that on a regular basis, right? And especially as unions are becoming, uh, when people stop paying money into the into unions, there'll be less staff and less ability to do the organizing, et cetera. So everybody's trying to do that organizing now. Um, there's also a right to work, a national right to work um, bill that is pending in the House. Um, people have different opinions as to whether that will become a priority for the Republican Party. Um, some of the thought process is that it might not be a priority simply because it may affect Trump's ability to get elected again. Um, or some people might think it does, and they might not want that to happen in his first term, and they might wait for his second term, if God forbid that were to happen. Um, so, um, yeah, and the whole point of it is that if you really think about it, the only institutions in this country that have any money to compete in politics that represent working people is unions, right? And organizations like this don't have money. Unions actually have money. Right? Exactly. So most community organizations don't have a lot of money. Most progressive groups don't have a lot of money. Unions actually have a way to make money and they have money. And they also have members that they can ask to make donations to their PACs. And members do make donations to our PACs. It's voluntary money, but there's a whole group of people that can be educated and involved in that. If you take unions out of it, and you've got nothing, not that they can really compete with the Koch brothers, um, but it's very scary what that means for this country. So that kind of segues into my, one of my questions where are we doing as much as we should be doing as unions? Like when I gave the example with the longshoremen and how they banded together and they, I mean I know it was against you know, a supremacist rally, right. but is there more we can there's always more we can be doing. Okay, so can you talk about that? Yeah, we should be doing that. I, I mean, you know, I, I mean, unions, I mean, it's really hard stuff because, again, unions have, there, there's ongoing work that you need to do to represent your members, and it takes time to negotiate contracts and deal with members' grievances, and members want to make sure that their contracts are enforced, and when they call their union rep, they're going to get an answer and all that stuff. Um, there's also you know, all the work that needs to happen politically. I mean, you know, in Los Angeles, part of why we, I mean, 20 years ago, Los Angeles was not the Los Angeles we have today in terms of its politics, right? I mean, I lived in San Francisco. Los Angeles was right wing. That's what we thought of it as. We didn't think of it as a progressive city. Um, you know, and there's been obviously a huge influx of, of immigrants into the city, but there's also been a real concerted effort by organized labor in this city to organize immigrant communities, get people registered to vote, to become a real force in politics in Los Angeles. And for that reason, we have fairly progressive, not everywhere, but fairly progressive representation. Um, and that is because of unions. Um, and that could happen in other parts of this country where it hasn't happened. I mean, the, the example that the LA County Federation of Labor has set has not been replicated the, to the degree that it should be um, in other parts of the country. So, yeah, we, could, we all need to be doing a hell of a lot more. I mean, it's really scary. I wanted to ask about um, healthcare. I think I was kind of combing through uh, some of the stuff that you've worked on, and one of them was, I believe, somehow attached to like a labor representative for healthcare, or there was a campaign or something. Um, but I, I just kind of wanted to ask because one of the things that we you mentioned earlier is that the best healthcare options usually that are available are through work, are through jobs and, and unions and things like that. Um, and recently, you know, we've been some of us have been working on the SB 562 campaign, and that was kind of like a really tough break when it got stalled. Um, so I kind of wanted to generally frame this question of like, how can is advocating for healthcare a way to get better things on the table for workers, or to try to 
maybe even push the idea of unionizing in a broader sense here in California or in LA? Is there a relationship between healthcare and work? I'm kind of like spitballing a little bit here. Someone wants to. I'm just trying to figure, figure out. I'm trying to work. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out the. Um, I mean, obviously, healthcare is a huge issue in terms of union organizing. I mean, right? I mean, in the entertainment industry, one of the reasons why we're so strong is anybody who works in the industry knows that if you're in a union job, you've got health insurance and a pension, and if you're not, you don't. It's very simple. So, you know, and that's part of why I ask is as strong as it is, because people understand that connection. Um, but then the issue becomes, again, our members remain unhappy that they haven't gotten major raises in 15 years, you know, there's stagnation on everything else that's going on, and it's because the cost of health care. So, I mean, until this country deals with the health care issue, um, Meaning, until there's single payer health care across this country, unions will continue to just be doing that, and workers will make no other advances. So, yeah, of course, there's a there's a connection, and you know, it's why lots of unions are involved in the campaign for healthy California. Um, do you think that's going to go national, like with Bernie announcing the Medicare for all and getting Elizabeth Warren announced her support today? And, Kamala Harris. So it's got some momentum. Do you think that's going to be a fight that Labor's taking on and it's going to be kind of like a campaign issue in 2018, 2020? Or do you think it's going to die out like the other single payer issues? Oh, I don't think the single payer issue is going to die out. <laughs> well, I mean, this effort yes. may be based on, rather. I mean, I think, that, I mean, again, single payer has been something that's been talked about within Labor and within this country for years. Bernie's the one who got it on the national stage in a way that hasn't happened before that and has gotten a new generation excited about it, which is kind of amazing, right? So the question then becomes, I mean, I don't see it going away as an issue. It's clearly an issue. It's clearly on the national stage. I mean, clearly there's nothing that's going to be done with single-payer health care with the Republican in charge of our government. So, I mean, yes, it's good that 676 is still there. It's good that Bernie's introducing the bill. Um, you know, hey, they said they're going to save the ACA, so maybe they'll figure out that it has to be done by a single payer. You know, <laughs> Republicans will come to the senses. I mean, you know, I mean, we just have to keep fighting, and yeah, that, that's going to be one of the issues. I mean, I think that everybody is very clear that I, I um, both like, within labor and within the progressive movement that everybody's priority needs to be November two thousand and eighteen. You know, and for those of us in Los Angeles, obviously, there's Steve Knight in CD25, and I'm sure everybody's got their eyes up there, and there's a lot of other places that we can go and help, but, and, you know, none of this stuff is going to happen in Washington until we deal with that problem. In terms of, you know, whether the state by state, I mean, a lot of people, obviously, everybody's really upset about the stalling of the bill. Um, you know, a lot of people are, have expressed concerns about the bill because it's just a, one state and it would be better if it was national. You know, people don't know the history of Canada, that it started province by province and then it became a national thing. So it's not going to go away. The question is going to be how long does it take us to get there and it's going to take the type of major progressive movement that needs to figure out how to congeal. You know, it's kind of, it's all there, but it's, it's not there yet. Question, which let me start by saying that, like, I think you're, what you're saying about, like, what I'm hearing you talk about is that we need a cultural shift in understanding of unions and why unions are important, what the history is, and all that stuff. And that's actually a lot of what we do at Ground Game is we have a media team, like, a those, and we do that education and that engagement on that cultural level, um, which is exactly what you're just talking about. So, in that vein, what do you think are the best points that we can highlight? Like, if we were to take on a project of like making a video about unions or something to that effect, like, do you, any guidance as far as I mean, like, I know what I'm. I, I I love unions. I know I can talk about what I think. But what do you what do you think are like some of the most important and, and most like uh, what in your work? What have you found to be the things that really move people? 
I mean, I, you know, what moves people is whatever is important to them. I mean, right? And anything that an organizer will tell you is that the, an organizing campaign is not necessarily about this. It's about, you know, meeting with you and having you tell me what your issue is and me figuring out how to make that issue part of our campaign. Um, right? I mean, that's yes. figuring out and how to really address your we, issues we and help you. in that, too. <laughs> right. We'll ground you for a reason. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so it's, yeah, how to deal with the real issues that are affecting people. Um, you know, I think that the history of labor in this country is gone. I think our, our members don't understand it. I don't think people understand what fights took place in order to get unions in the first place. So we're complacently allowing them to be destroyed, um, you know, without remembering that people died on picket lines. People, you know, had sit-down strikes and took over factories and people were attacked by Pinkerton guards and everything else that is the history, I, you know, I don't know how you get people to understand history and then put it into the context of the type of movement we need to create in this country. But I mean, it all goes back to the only way we ever win thing in this country is when there's a major mass movement, whether it's a union movement, whether it's a civil rights movement. Um, at this point, we need it all to come back. Yeah. yeah, I think one of the ways that we've tried to look at things is to, is to do exactly that from what is the thing that people are not understanding? What is the what is the piece of information that's missing, right? That if people had that, they would understand. Like we, when we talk about healthcare, and we're going to help your video, and it's one of those things there is that people don't know what. Right? We're talking about, right? No, I mean it's Why amazing with, with you know with union members within the entertainment industry who are you know get upset because they have to pay a fifty dollar a month premium for their you know family health coverage, right. who just have no clue what it took to get. I mean that that are so taken those benefits for granted, right. you know that it was never a fight. It never it was never not there. It was always there, and it's expected. Yeah. And if anything worsens from it or if, if anything is diminished it's your fault or it's my fault right it's my fault it's one of the union negotiators and um without really understanding that maybe there needs to be a re-engagement of our members in the process of fighting for things uh, going right along with that and especially on the health care like let's be really really optimistic and say that single payer whether it's in california with classes two or, or national single payer becomes reality do you think that union leader, like once the, the employers no longer have to pay for health care, does, does union leadership, do you think, um, see that as an opportunity to, to get that money, to win that money in other areas? Or do you think there's fear that the, the union membership will will see the opposite, that, that health care is one less thing they need to negotiate, and, and so the union is even less, less important? To important. Um, I'm sure there's people who feel both of those things, right? I mean, if it, I mean, honestly, it's a hell of a lot easier to organize somebody into my union right now because they want their health benefits. And if they already had their health benefits, set up to talk to them about something else that's not quite as immediate, right? But, um, I mean, so what? I mean, you know, we need to fix that issue. And clearly, if our employers were paying less to insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies, they could pay our members more money, um, right? I mean, because it's, the, it's their dollars as well as workers' dollars that are going there. And so as much money as we could save them, we have to then have the strength to negotiate that somewhere else. Yeah. Can I add to that? Because I know, like, in our union right now, I, feel, I personally feel like if we didn't have to deal with the medical and all the money going to medical, it would be so much stronger in negotiation. Of course. And we would start to get, of course. Like, there are some, there are some categories in our union that are below minimum wage, mm -hmm. actually, per hour. So, and they're fighting to, they put their own street right up there, but their scale is below minimum wage. It's There's nobody below minimum wage. Well, right okay, here. 14. Sorry. That's definitely not below minimum wage. Okay, sorry. Below, below 15. 15. Yeah. Sorry. Right. Not minimum wage. Below what we would like to be minimum wage, but right. it is not. But it's pretty low <laughs> for the for the industry standards. Right. So, and they're fighting to negotiate that because, because all this money is going to the top. Right. So we would have more strength. Oh, I mean, absolutely. I mean, as I said, the only thing that unions have negotiated over in the last 15 years, I mean, a slight exaggeration, obviously there's been some other issues, but the vast majority of negotiations has been saving our health insurance. Mm -hmm. 
and our pension secondarily, but our health insurance. All right, we're gonna try to wrap in a couple minutes, so if you have some last questions, get them in there. Um, there's something you kind of touched on a little bit earlier, which is how, what, what, what techniques do you foresee being um, useful in energizing a unionized base, like people that already have negotiated for better pay and, and pension and health care, how do we get these people to then care about the rest of us who don't get that stuff? Because I mean, I, as, as a former member of the, of the union, like when I would go to meetings, the, the, the turnout was very small, and it was people who were mostly griping about things that happened 30 years ago. Right. Yeah, I mean, as, again, <laughs> organizing, organizing, and organizing. I mean, I think that unions, many unions have become complacent. And I think some have woken up and are doing a wonderful job of organizing. Others don't. And by organizing, that means going out on a regular basis and talking to their members about issues um, so that their members don't come in and bitch about something that happened 30 years ago. I mean, I, I've been at, at my IA local for four and a half years, and when I came in, all people were doing was fighting with each other. That was it. Nothing else. Um, and I think we've done a pretty decent job of turning that around where there's at least a core group of people that kind of understand our mission and kind of want to, you know, work with us. But um, it means talking to people. And on the healthcare issue, let's face it, everybody, whether you're a union member or not, you know somebody, whether it's your kid, you know, whether it's your aunt, whether it's whoever it may be, you know somebody who has a health care story. I mean, I certainly do, and I have the best health insurance you could possibly have. I mean, I've worked, all I've done is in my life is work for unions, and I have always had the best health insurance. My husband does too, so we have double cuts. You know, we have the best. And I understand very clearly what the crisis is. Um, you know, I have a 20... Five-year-old son with, who needs to get dependent health coverage, and it costs a ridiculous amount of money from his employer, where he's not making any money. So that's everybody, right? Everybody. So we need to start talking to people about their families, about you know, beyond just talking to them about work. Uh, one of the things you mentioned, real quick, these unions are one of the big things that have money. They're like in the progressive fight. What's the appetite for them to actually leverage like that money in more out of the box ways like this time around? Like after 2016 was sort of the democratic establishment like centralizing and spending all the money, what do people want to take chances? They want to use their packs to fund groups like this? Like what are, what's the spending plan for groups? I don't think I can really answer that for, you know, I'm sure that every organization has their different thought process on it. That makes sense. It's a really broad question. Yeah, that's a very. <laughs> I've probably pontificated on a lot of stuff that I can't yeah. really know yeah. about, but that one <laughs> even harder. Too far. Yeah. <laughs> Can you think of any out of the way boxes, out of the box ways we should be spending it as a pack, or? I don't know it's spending money, spending on, on PAC, I mean, PAC money, I mean, PAC money is not, I mean, you can spend any money to spend a group like this. PAC money is specifically for funding politicians, I and mean, that's what PACs are for, is giving donations to politicians for their campaigns, or to initiatives for their campaigns. Yeah, like, you can hire volunteers, or, like, staff volunteers, and spend right. money in that way, like, in-kind companies, right. all that You could stuff. do that, right, absolutely, you could do that if you're PAC money as well, right. I keep thinking about the... You know, we said people lost the history, right? Uh -huh. uh, and a hundred years ago, eighty years ago, uh, you know, there were there was the international workers of the world. They were talking about one big union. They wanted to collectivize everything. You know, like uh, the the dream. Now we now we have automation that is taking away people's work and replacing it with machines. That would actually have been a dream of socialist utopia in this hundred years ago, that one day machines would do the work for us because they assumed we would benefit from it, that that, 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 that profit would be shared among everyone. Yeah. You know? So, you know, maybe we need to be lobbying for a national guaranteed income, you know, and and trying to reduce the work that people are actually doing. You know, we should we should, you know, invest in these machines and and you know, let people get spend more time uh, enlarging their horizons, you know, yeah. developing themselves, you know, but well, let's yeah, be that, that's a big picture thing. I mean, let's be real. Americans work more than people in other industrialized 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we work more, we earn less, we, yeah. you know, are more stressed out, we have worse health insurance. Yeah, because all we don't have that socialized mentality, right. which is actually, well, you know, I want my gun and I want to protect my home. And we've had, had decades and decades and decades, like a century of militant anti-communism in America, right. which exactly. has wiped out a lot of the, Oh. Organized well, wiped out. Okay. Yeah, not, well, not just hope, but wiped out a lot of the groups and organizers doing that right. stuff. I mean, like they yeah. drop bombs on their shit. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, let's be real. The unions in this country were organized by communists, a lot of them, right? And then you had the McCarthy era, and you had the purging of communists from unions, and you had complacent unions that weren't as militant anymore. And here we are, right? I mean. And this country is has moved. I mean, anytime I talk to, to people about the fact that the first election that I voted in was in 1980, and think about what's happened since then. And I mean, we were taken aback. You know, I lived in Berkeley, and you know, 1980, and Ronald Reagan was elected. It was like, what? I mean, that's not the world I lived in. But we are so. I wish Ronald Reagan was president right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at least. Yeah. 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 Yeah.